So think of me as like kind of a con man who's not breaking any laws, but knows exactly where your brain will go. I think mentalism is the biggest sham, the biggest scam. I think it's the biggest scam in the world. Is that what you're doing? I'm not doing that. I get inside your head and fool your mind. It's a recipe. I know how to read people, but I'm not doing it in an unethical way. Being blown away works in every language, every culture, everyone. Oh, oh my God. How did you do that? This was incredible. <laughs> I want you to close your eyes. eyes Everyone who's watching on YouTube, I'm gonna show you this so you can see this. And that's the place you just wrote down, isn't it? How the hell did you just do that? Was Perlman, you've built your entire career as a mentalist, which sounds pretty badass and cool, but I gotta start with the most obvious question, which is what the hell is a mentalist? <laughs> so a magician does tricks to fool your eyes. I get inside your head and fool your mind. So there's no kind of in between. There's no sleight of hand in what I do. I've analyzed the way people think, the way they behave, and present it in a very entertaining fashion. So think of me as like kind of a con man who's not breaking any laws, but knows exactly where your brain will go. You know, a road has two paths. I know when you're taking A, I know when you're taking B, I know when you change your mind from A to B. And that's my whole living. That's what I do for a career. Now, when I saw that we had booked you for the show, I'm going to be completely honest because I always try to do that, but, but not be insulting. I think mentalism is the biggest sham, the biggest scam. I was super resistant until, I, until I was Me like... Too. I think it's the biggest scam in the world, but I'm somehow oh. doing it. Go figure. <laughs> but here's the thing. It's because my first thing that comes to mind is someone like tricking it's like you remember do you remember that psychic woman who used to be on the tv in the 90s totally. uh you know yes, who was like yep you know one nine hundred numbers like my, my thought was like hey you know it's just people taking advantage of people in time of grief or in time of need right. or there's that bradley cooper movie where he's a traveling <laughs> mentalist who gets in trouble with like the mob and stuff it's so good and and then I watched your stuff and I was like, this guy is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'm hooked. I'm sold. Where you totally won money? me over before you even showed up here. So you talk about being the con man who doesn't con people. You said that more as a joke, but honestly, I would say I have more in common with a con man in certain elements because you know the way people think. So the best kind of con man, if you ever look, there's a show called American Greed on CNBC, which I've loved, which every show is the same. It's like, how did these idiots give their money to this person who then stole it, right? So I'm not doing that, but the same mentality, which is people can feel when someone's selling them something. If you're a bad salesman, people can feel it. This is any business. You don't even have to be a salesperson. Teachers are selling attention to their students, right? If you're not good at selling, people get very defensive. They feel on guard. So what you do is you wanna make people feel comfortable, build rapport, and the best salespeople, they sell themselves. Your customer throws their money at you. They wanna buy the product. You almost have to push them away. So what I'm doing is I'm selling a concept, which is that I know how to read people, which is 100% true, but I'm not doing it in an unethical way. The same way you described conning people at their time of need when they wanna to talk to a dead relative. I have no supernatural powers. Everything I do, you could do if you were willing to train 25 years and had a natural knack, right? It's like a musician. I'm never gonna play violin at Carnegie Hall. It ain't in the cards for me. I just don't have that ear, that tone, that touch, that pitch, or sing that way. But certain people do, and this was something I had a knack for that I was willing to train for decades. So at this point in your career, and we're gonna take a step back in a little bit and figure out how you got here. But at this point in your career, you've hit your 10,000 hours, you're a master of reading people or watching people. What are you looking for? Are you looking for, um, I used to love this TV show, uh, and I don't even remember what it's called. Maybe it was called The Mentalist. Mentalist. I don't remember, but it, yep. it was the show about the guy who was like working with the FBI and he'd yep. say if people looked up to the left, they're engaging a certain part of the brain and they're making it up. And if they do this and they do that, and it, is that what you're doing? So it's kind of a simplistic way to put it in, in the sense of not to knock you, but like if there was a one size fits all approach where I could tell you in 20 minutes, do all this stuff and it will work. It's a recipe, right? It's kind of like a chef who knows how to make dishes in six or seven or eight different ways and they still have a great hamburger at the end. So I have a lot of tools in my belt of ways I can do what I do. Some of them involve looking, some of them involve pausing. Some of them involve the fact that I just know the way certain people will behave in different situations. Think about this. If you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody, let's say you have a boss, which most of us do. Even if you run your own business, if you have a spouse, you have a boss. And if you so, have clients, <laughs> you have a boss. <laughs> yes. And so one-on-one, -on -one, people behave very differently than in groups. That's like a something everybody knows, group dynamics. 
corporate environments. I love noticing how the boss is with the people that work for them until their boss shows up. And suddenly you see a whole shift in body language, behavior, the tone of their voice even changes. So I kind of know how to work crowds and my whole skill is knowing who the right people are to pick on in my show that are gonna be the most malleable, the biggest boisterous reactions. The same includes on TV where, will I get a good reaction out of this person? Will the trick even work? Which is very high risk, high reward when you're doing stuff for millions or tens of millions of people in some instances in my career, live on TV, not to skirt the question, everything you just said I do. NLP tactics, knowing where people look, how they behave, but also the way you can rush someone into a decision changes how they behave incredibly. If somebody has five minutes to think about something, they will make a completely different choice than if they have five seconds. Oh, I love this so much. Okay, (laughs) let's dig into as much of the craft as we can. But before we do, let's take a step back. So You fell in love with magic when you were 13 and on a cruise with your family. I think that that's a really impressionable age. But most people who go like at 13, I mean, at 13, I wanted to be a race car driver in NASCAR (laughs) and started a band, (laughs) even though I was not very good. I think most of us do. And all of that stuff I wanted to do at 13, I'm not doing any of that stuff. And so how is it that you went from falling in love with something at that age to building an entire career? And not even a career. Like you're in Hollywood, you're on TV, you've won an Emmy. I made a joke earlier about the Emmy on the on the shelf. Like like you're a big deal. You're building a brand and you're it's all on your shoulders. So walk me through. How do you get from 13 to going pro? This is a long question answer. I don't want to bore you to death. So I did this not because of some idea of a career in the future. Like I had no idea that this is a job you could have, which I think is so important nowadays to mentor other people, to show them what is possible and isn't because I did not know. If you watch a movie and you're 12 years old, right? I remember that movie Independence Day. I'm watching Will Smith. I never thought I could be Will Smith. I'm like, that's a guy. I don't know how he got there. But in entertainment, there's no playbook. It's not kind of like being a doctor where my parents say, do good at school, get a good SAT, do pre-med, go to medical school, and now you're a doctor, right? There's a formula. This had no formula. I did not know this was an option. You could check a box. So I went to university. I studied engineering at Michigan. (laughs) Go blue. I ended up working on Wall Street. All of those things things I think really changed my trajectory. If you look in the future and the fact of what I do now, I couldn't have had any of the success I had now without those stepping stones. I know they seem completely disjointed, but going to university, working in corporate America, all of those things gave me a tremendous leg up in what I do now, which is being primarily a corporate performer as well as on TV. But I did this as my side hustle. I did this to pay for college because my folks divorced and this kind of filled a void for me. I think a lot of people have some sort of trauma in their life. It was not a good divorce. And so magic was my escape. I did magic to not deal with kind of the ramifications of my family exploding. And this was what I did as kind of like, this is what I put all my passion and effort into was card tricks, magic. And I started working when I was 14. So at age 14, I was already learning sales, how to make money, how to promote myself. Because by the age of 16, I finished high school. I went to college. Nobody paid for my college. I, like My parents couldn't afford to pay for college. So I did this to pay for schooling. And I had a couple side businesses, but this is how tuition and rent and food got on my plate. <laughs> and so in those early days, you may have been really young. It was a passion. It was a side hustle. At what point did you take it seriously enough to be able to say, you know what? This is... Uh, it may have been when you were working at... I think you were working at Merrill Lynch. But yep. at what point did you go, you know what? This is actually a thing that could be my thing. You know, you have kind of epiphany moments, which sometimes you see them in the moment, where sometimes you only see them in hindsight. Do you know that kind of feeling where later on you realize, wow, somebody just flipped a switch? And there was a magician, I remember this conversation vividly, where I didn't think you could do this for a career. Even though I was working restaurants three of the nights of the week, I was doing all these parties on the side. And I had this conversation with a magician who's a professional. And he's like, when are you going to quit your job? And I was like, what are you, crazy? I'm not quitting my job. But I've got a great paycheck. I actually had a very good job. If you look backwards, I had an amazing career opportunity. I was making way too much money as a 21-year-old. And I just said, why would I quit my job? And he goes, well, do you love it? And I go, well, no. And he goes, do you love doing magic? And I said, yes. These were all simple questions. And then he goes, well, what do you need? And I just threw out a number. At the time, I'm like, I got to make six figures. And he goes, well, what do you make per show now? And he just literally, in the span of 90 seconds, took all this 
jumbled thing in my brain that just aligned my focus, which is said, well, what do you, you need X amount of shows. How many shows do you know? What's the increase? And you just broke it down. He goes, well, can you double your amount of shows in the next year? And I go, well, yeah. And he goes, then what's the problem? And it's one of those moments where, what is the problem? And he just like, so many of us have these desires. We want to do these things that we dream for, but we never break it down into attainable small goals that you realize I can make it from point A to B to C to D and eventually I'll be at my dream. So it was that, it was luck and timing, which is I had no kids, I wasn't married. Do you know what? If I quit my job, what's the worst that happens, Mark? I'll find another job. That's how I You'll go back to IT afterwards, right? It's true, but if this would have happened four years later in 2009 when there was the Great Recession, I probably wouldn't have the balls. I would have said, I don't know if I could find another job. So you got to find timing and you got to have that little bit of luck in life but I also feel you can't swim if you're always on the, like you got to jump in the deep end eventually. And I need to cut the cord and not have a paycheck coming in to be hungry enough to wake up on the couch one morning and be like, what do I do? There's no playbook for being a professional mentalist. I don't know how to do it, figure it out. And I think so many entrepreneurs, which I know is your audience base has something going on and you need to find the people that you can emulate that have done what you want to do. They're five years out there, 10 years out from where you are. Learn from them. Buy them a lunch. Give them compliments. Be a little bit consistent and persistent. Don't be a pain in the butt, but be just a pain in the butt enough where they know you really want it. I have people that DM me five, six, seven times. And on that eighth time, they catch me at the right moment. I'm like, let me get on the phone with you right now and let's discuss and let's see how we take your career from A to B to C. I know that you're a huge fan of comedy. I am as well. Huge. What have you learned from the comics that you've either spent time with or just watching their performance craft? Oh, man. So I think first is that everyone says you're not funny the first 10 years. And man, is that true? Like I look back at the things that I was doing 10 years ago and cringe, just cringe when I see myself. <laughs> and was just it good see, or it was, it was good at the time and now you're so much better? You might think it was good. You know what? Magic and mentalism are a funny thing where even when it's bad, it's still good. It's like pizza. It's one of those things where if you enjoy it, you'll enjoy watching and it's still amazing. People love amazement and amazement transcends everything. Comedy, music, any form of entertainment you want to discuss is subjective where not everyone aligns. The one thing I have going for me is that being blown away works in every language, every culture, every one. So it's kind of a universal fabric. Music is still great, don't get me wrong, but you might not love Beyonce and 90% of the world does. Versus if I do something absolutely incredible, like look at you and tell you the name of your best friend and your six, every single person in the world is blown away by that. It's universal. So that's the one thing really going for it. But comedians are the purest form of the craft. All they do is stand up with a microphone and their words. And they can entertain thousands, if not millions of people. Like Chris Rock, millions of people on a Netflix special. I'm not confident enough or I haven't jumped to that level yet of being a stand-up comedian. What I'm doing has been successful enough. But it's the closest purity to that because I don't have any props. I can do a show for several thousand people with nothing. I could show up with just a suit and tie, maybe a marker and a pad of paper to do some reveals, but I don't really need anything. I am the show. I think there's a lot we can learn from that because, you know, as part of our research, I have my producer go through and look through YouTube at the guests' previous performances or previous videos. And then we look for retention spikes in in the content because we want to see what were the moments or the question, or like, I'm giving a little bit away here, audience, totally. but but we um, we look to see which moments had the biggest audience retention spike, so that way we can go, okay, this is what people are interested in. And as we work through your content, every spike came at the moment of reveal. Yep. Like every spike was that, what? It's you, you know, surprising Heidi Klum, or it's you, you know, working with NFL players and like having that, that reveal moment. There is something, and this is what comedy is as well. It's Jimmy Carr talks about, it's, it's simply the moment of surprise. Right. It's you thought that we, I was leading you one way. You thought we were speaking about this one thing. And then I'm going to say something that reveals the fact that it's totally different. It's not what you thought it was. Right. And with your surprises, your, your gotcha moments, it's this moment of just like revealing how the hell did you just <laughs> do this? <laughs> like, we know, we know you did it somehow. Right. How the hell did you do this? 
Right. That that's the hope. The hope is that you're fooled, you're entertained, but mostly what I describe is what I do for a living is I create memorable moments. So if you think of a movie that you watch that's a popcorn flick, that's kind of a blockbuster, a lot of these comic book movies, not to knock them, they blend together. And so you leave and a month later you don't remember them. So my whole career and what I focus on, I know it sounds silly, is learning the way memory works because memory is malleable. People that think your memory is the same as a video are utterly wrong. Not even 90, they're hundred percent wrong. You can manipulate people's memories based on the way you speak, based on where you pause, based on the speed at which you, like everything you do is you create memories. And I try to create memories for my audience. And if you leave and you forget me, that's the death. That's the worst thing I could do. If you have forgotten about me, I don't care if you figure out every trick I did, as long as you're engaged. It's kind of like what you just said with the algorithm. Attention is the drug of the masses now. It's how do you retain people's attention and how do you leave them wanting more or talking about you, which is good and bad. Good and bad works. I prefer good, but bad, funny enough, when you mentioned videos, I did a video with John Cena on the Today Show and it has five to 10X the views because there was a mess up where I went on right before I went on air and I forgot to button my sleeve. So when I'm talking, my sleeve moves up and you see writing on my sleeve and everyone goes in comments. I saw it before he did, I saw it before he, because John Cena grabs my arm, thinks of a person and then the name appeared on my arm. So people blew up the comments, a, a thousand more comments than anything else because they caught me. They don't know how I knew what he was gonna think of, but they saw the writing in advance. And so what's funny is having people engaged is the most important thing in the world. It's what can you do to stand out from the crowd? And I think marketers, branders, everybody knows this. You can't just do what everybody else is doing. You got to create your own trends. It's so important, whatever you is, differentiate yourself. You either need to be different or you need to be better than everybody else at what you do. That's the key. That's a great lesson. Speaking of, I guess, fuck ups, it's where we learn the most. What were some of the lessons, the painful lessons that you learned when things kind of went sideways? I learn every time. So I like to do big swings. A lot of the people that do what I do, they kind of get momentum. So think of most things where you're culturally relevant, right? You get some big TV show, you're on it, then it goes away, then people are like, where'd you go? So in my career, what's allowed me to really adapt is I do so many different networks. Nobody else that does what I do has been on like CNBC, ESPN, Bravo, cooking channels. Like it doesn't make sense. They're like, why is a mentalist on all these weird channels? It's because I never make you think about me. My, my mission is not look how great I am. Look what I can do. I go to a producer the way a salesperson does. I go to your producer. I know your demographic. I know your target age. I know who they are. I know what they watch. I know what they buy. If I go on Rachel Ray, I know that they're going to be all about cooking. It's primarily skews towards housewives that are age 25 to 49. And I make my content like literally gift wrap with a book. I go, I'm going to do a recipe. Rachel's going to think of it about somebody in your family that she loves. And it's going to be centered around Valentine's day. They're like, who is this guy? Literally, I checked every <laughs> You've box. You've mastered the pitch. Well, I've mastered the pitch because no one cares about you. It's the number one thing to realize. You shouldn't be what's special. What's special to everyone is themselves. The number one topic of conversation anyone wants to talk about is themselves, their family, and their passions. So if you can turn the mirror around and make it feel like everyone watching you is getting something about themselves in it. If what they love is sports. I'm going to do tricks that are all about sports. If you love baseball, I'm going to do a trick that's all about baseball and who's going to hit the most home runs this season and what game are you looking for and who's your team and it's going to be all centered around you, the viewer. And so that's what I do in my corporate events, my public performances. I make it about the audience, which I know sounds cliche, but it's the differentiating point between me and everyone else in my profession. And that's the reason I keep getting on different TV shows because when I go to a producer, I pitch them ideas that they love for their audience. It has nothing to do with me. That's amazing. And I love your answer. We should be listening to this and taking notes. But this is We Do Hard Things. And so I'm going to circle back around on the question, which is, I want to hear when things messed up and the lessons oh, you learned oh, from yeah. it. So absolutely. So I've had big mess ups, man. So when I say big swings is in the moment, if I'm doing a stage show for a group, I can undo a mess up. So think about a movie where you don't know what the ending is, right? So if you know the ending, if I say to you, hey, think of your best friend when you were six. And now it seems like I'm going to guess it. But at the end, I go, guess what? I have a box right here. I open it up and there's a picture of the person. You didn't know where it was going to go, right? It's a pick your adventure where you don't know where I'm going to end up. So 
the best mess ups are the ones where I have a plan B and a plan C and I can get out of it. And you don't realize I messed up big time, but I found a way out of it. Okay. But when you're on live national TV, when there's been mess ups, like I've had mess ups where I had Al Roker just say a name and it wasn't the name at all that I had. And you're like, Oh my God, there's <laughs> millions of people watching. And so in that moment, that's when you hyper focus. That's when time stops. I assume it's gotta be like what a lot of people go through an adrenaline moment. Their kid is about to take you by car. They lift up the car. They burst. Like my mind forgets everything. And I focus in the moment. How do I get through this? How do I find a way out of it with the time clicking down and my segment ending? And I said to him, what if you change your mind right now? And you thought of a woman and he went, uh, Taylor Swift. And somehow by some miracle, it worked, but it, I, I can't explain it. There's no way to rehearse these things until they happen. You learn what to do different, how to troubleshoot. And I'm willing to take those risks because if I do stuff that's safe every time, I don't grow and my audience knows it. My audience sees me do things. And so I'll take risks. If you watch most of my shows in live, if you see me in a live show, I will mess up at least once or twice in a show. And that's not on purpose but I hope to, because if I don't mess up, then the show gets boring. Think of a trapeze artist, you know, somebody who, who walks a high wire. This is the best yeah. example. If that person just walks across it, like boom, just walks across it. Do you know what you think? You think that's easy. I probably could do that. But if they walk across it and they have that stick and all of a sudden oh, they shake and they like go like this and you go, oh my, you know, you feel it in your stomach. You know, it's an actual visceral reaction. Your fight or flight, your hippocampus literally tells your body to just seize up and you get that fight or flight because you see them and you sense danger. That's in your lizard brain. So if they don't do that, then you don't feel the danger. And so in my act, if I don't go for a couple things that are totally like, I'm like, you, by the way, were seven years old when this happened. And they're like, no, I was 12. You're like, what, what happened there, bro? And I go, I honestly don't get it right every time because I'm trying for stuff that's out of my reach. And so people, when you do that, they go, he didn't try to mess up. I mean, I didn't. So they realize how much harder everything else is by oh. getting some things wrong. That's brilliant. You must also be training yourself as well to get really comfortable, you know, with, with the fact that you can recover or work to recover from any situation and then you fear the mess up less. I don't fear the mess up at all. It's kind of actually, I embrace it. I don't like to bomb, but you're absolutely right. Bombing is the best gift. Because when you kill it, when you go do a show and everybody loves you and they adore you, you don't learn anything. You really don't come out of it with new knowledge on how to improve. It's when things go wrong that you analyze, assess, and try to. If you're kind of a perfectionist, there's a lot of people I know that, man, they're the most confident performer I've ever met. They're like, killed it again. My show was awesome. And I... I don't want to say I envy their confidence, but I see their show and I'm like, your show wasn't that great. So <laughs> I'm amazed that you're so happy with what you did. I don't revel in it. I'm always a perfectionist. I rarely think it was great. I always think things I'm doing could use improvement. I generally find myself to be a lazy person, even though I run like 20 miles a day, but that I consider that kind of lazy because I like running, but I will avoid things I don't like doing. So, you know, rewriting ad copy for my website, nightmare. I don't want to, I will delay it for weeks. I will keep pushing it in my calendar to next week until my manager's like, when are you going to rewrite the ad copy? I'm like, I don't know, I'm busy. So you've got to work on your weaknesses and I'm guilty as charged as well. So walk me through if you can, how you think or work through the bomb. So you have a bad show, you have a bad segment, you have a bad thing. Walk me through, what do you do? Do you journal? Do you hit the bottle? Like, how do you, how do you handle and work through it so that way you can come out on the other side going, oh, I've just unlocked the next thing. Oh, like, I'm journaling while boozing. Mark has figured me out. He's like a mentalist. <laughs> well, I don't know. I heard some interviews. You like to drink, maybe. Uh, I, listen, COVID, who didn't start drinking, honestly? Uh, not to an extent of a problem, thank goodness. But I definitely a beard to, to cool down after a show works well, works wonders, unless I'm in hardcore marathon training mode. But I take notes. So after every single event I do, I literally write down everything that happened, which I think is useful both for my retention, but also to analyze what occurred. And I think this is useful in your business, in life. I've kind of looked back and tried to ascertain what have I done correctly 
that's brought me to where I am now. And some things that you don't realize that are accidental that you stumble on, I've seen this because I have a lot of friends who run startups. I have a lot of friends that are entrepreneurs and I analyze with them, what did you do that went well? What did you do that didn't? What did you invest in that was a poor investment? A lot of these things you don't know in hindsight and a lot of them you don't even realize. They're innate. So when I bomb, most of my bombs at this point I'm not gonna say aren't my fault because I don't wanna shift blame, but they have to do with things that are outside of my control directly. So things like production value. For example, I did a show on Saturday for a large country club and there's certain rules. And I did a show a week ago for a large corporation and there's things that I know will go wrong. So if you're a performer like me that's interactive, if you're in an outdoor show, instantly, that show is 50% as strong as an indoor show. The same for comedians, because comedy requires laughter and laughter needs to reverberate. People will tell you, if you ever go to the Comedy Cellar in New York City, it's the best comedy room in the world. It's small, ceilings are low. The sound travels in such a way that you hear people laughing, which makes you laugh. If you don't hear other people in my show going, oh, Oh my God, you don't hear that. If it's quiet, you're not as impressed. It's funny because it feeds on itself. It's self-fulfilling. It's kind of like a positive feedback loop that grows. And it's when I started doing Zoom shows during COVID and we had everybody muted, my show sucked. I was like, what is this? So we started to learn, unmute people. So you hear people going, what the, and swearing, going, oh my God, like you need that energy. So my issue there was that the audience was too far away. At one of my shows, there's a dance floor in between. I know for a fact that if there's a dance floor between me and the audience, it takes longer for me to run off stage and on stage, and I go on and off the stage 20 times in a show. If that takes 10 extra seconds, Mark, that's three minutes and 30 seconds of dead time. I have to fill in a 45-minute show, which you don't realize is 8% of the show. It kills your strength. So for them, they loved it. For me, that was a B show. That wasn't an A minus or a B plus. That was a B show at best. And that was before I even started. Learning the pace that you have to speak at, learning when to pause, to let the joke simmer. All of those things, when I bomb, I try to analyze, what did I do wrong? What can I improve? What was within my control? And it's kind of like if you're the president, the buck stops here. I'm never going to say to someone else, hey, this sound guy screwed up my whole show. That's my fault. I should have done more testing. I should have been more insistent. And I kind of hold myself to a higher standard. I love everything about you. Oh my goodness. Uh, like I'm getting all of these like stoic type vibes. You hang out with entrepreneurs all the time. It seems like you've spent quite a bit of time not only developing your craft and understanding how people think and react and understanding the environment and the pace and the moment. And you know, you talked about the tools that you have in your bag. But it sounds like you've spent a lot of time working on yourself. Is, is that true? I don't know. I mean, I like to think I have some emotional intelligence and have grown like with years over time. You seem like the, the mentalist performing version of Ryan Holiday or David Goggins or something. I know, running, I've known David for a long time. You're running the Blackwater and you're doing all these endurance things. And it's like, you are just talking my language. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I think that the mentorship programs and things of the sort were gleaned from people that know more than you. I've gone through it. I think like social media... Overall, it's got positive notes, but negative notes. And I've learned when you say have grown, I used to have a real compare and despair mentality, which is even if I'm at the top of the game, I look at people that are you know near me or above me and I'm just jealous, not of what they have. It's not a material thing, but I, it makes me think like, I'm not working hard enough. Look at what this person's doing. Look what she's doing. Look what he's doing. And it makes me feel lazy and less than. And I've learned that's the wrong mindset. You have to take like negative one times negative one and whatever you have to fix inside yourself, I've gotten rid of that. I don't have jealousy. It pushes me and says, they're kicking butt. I need to find a way to kick butt as well. And so I've really flipped a switch in the last two or three years of gratitude, which I always felt was so cliche, so like LA and new age. But no, honestly, think to yourself, you should be so happy wherever you are in life, no matter what you have. And I know there's people listening to this who, you know, can barely pay the bills and they have problems. They might be taking care of a relative. Like you don't know people's environment, but if you've got health and you're breathing and alive, you're a leg up on billions of people that have already died. You know what I mean? Like do what you can and be positive and uplifting. Like you'll watch documentaries, people that lost their legs, got into an accident, come back and do Ironmans. I met this guy with no legs who did an Ironman in Hawaii. We were both there. And dude, he literally took off his prosthetic legs and dumped blood out of him. Like, I mean, so horrific, but dude, he finished with no legs. So I've really come to that conclusion of keep pushing yourself, try to enjoy the moment, what you're doing, but have goals 
and have real workable solutions to get to those goals. Don't just talk about them, make it happen. Hmm. You mentioned earlier that you've developed a skill because you love it and anyone could do what you can do. But it seems like you found this perfect combination of uh, not only the craft being a performer, but being an entrepreneur, being self-employed. There's no way to know in the entertainment industry in Hollywood whether you're moving in the right direction or not the right direction and whether things are going up or down or all of that uncertainty. So what would you say are the two or three elements that make you successful? There was a Venn diagram of what you focused on or what you naturally have that has led to your success. So I think there's some level of know your strengths and brand awareness. So I, I tried out for a show, America's Got Talent, and I did not get on the first time I tried. Uh, so this is really important to note because a lot of people that I kind of, I don't really want to say coach, but they will ask me for advice because they're going to go on that show. And they got third place. And so they're like, what did you do? How did you get there? And 2015 and season 10, you got, you, you finished third place, right? So yes. you obviously, and if anyone wants to go onto YouTube, you can watch the video. It's fantastic. It, it, there's a great co compilation, but it's fun. It's bananas. You're blowing everyone's mind. I didn't know that you didn't get on the first time. Didn't get on. The first time I tried out for the show, I actually had what's called more of like the red carpet entrance. So I had a producer call. That's when the producers call you directly instead of going to an audition. And they say to you, hey, come in. They give you a time. It's very cushy. It's kind of like a first class entry versus a Greyhound bus. I went there. It went terribly. Now, two things could go against me. One, they didn't know I was going to do mentalism. So a mentalist requires somebody's mind to read. They brought me in a room with just a cameraman and they go, go. And I go, I can't go. It's like, I need, it's, I need someone whose mind to read. So somebody came in who was a PA, like a production assistant who had a head sound, who was completely not paying attention. And it was a terrible trick because they were not paying attention, didn't get a reaction. It didn't go well because I wasn't set up for success, which you could blame them. You could blame me. You could blame timing. Two years later, I came back and I did what's known as a cattle call. I went into a huge pier with maybe 4,000 other people, waited nine hours, you know, the opposite of, of a red velvet rope they opened. I waited just like everybody else. And I didn't care. Mark, I didn't care one iota if I did it, didn't do it. Like I, I had nothing hanging on it. So I went in there like I completely free of any stress. There was no nervousness. There was nothing like that. I just was going in and say, screw it. My wife keeps telling me to do it. My buddy loves Howard Stern. Howard Stern's the host. He's like, you know, go. I was, I'll finally, I'll get them off my back. And I went in there. And because I didn't care at all and there was no pressure, I think I just killed it. I was so loose. I was so relaxed. I mean, honestly, when they brought me into the next room, I even made the joke. I go, guys, get rid of everybody else. You already found the guy who's going to win a million bucks. Like I just talk like just, it wasn't flippant, but I was just so joking because I really didn't care. They loved it. They loved the energy. And most people, when they don't care, they go into something with a looseness. You can sense tension. My whole profession is sensing tension and you, you can do it. Everyone can do it. You can sense when someone's about to lie. You have like a spider sense. We've learned it over thousands of years of evolution. You know, when someone's in a panic mode, when they're about to do something, I didn't have any of that. So I got on the show and I made a conscious aware, like awareness of how I want my story to be. My narrative was I worked on Wall Street, which is great because my goal was not to leave there and have my own show in Vegas. My show was to amplify what I'm already doing, which is corporations. Corporations spend the most money, far more than private parties. Generally speaking, unless you get to a very high level of having your own theater. And even then you'd be surprised how big a theater is versus doing large corporate events like Dana Carvey, there's a lot of acts that you thought of like were really big. And then you're like, where do they go? They started making enormous sums of money by doing corporate events instead of just touring I, theaters. I, I knew a guy who made a lot of money through real estate. Yep. And when he got married in Italy, he flew everyone to Italy for this wedding. And then each night he had like pop stars yep. perform. And this was the first time I'd ever really heard about this corporate world or what have you. But I was like, what? Like, you know, I'm, I'm Canadian. And so this is maybe over a decade ago. So I was like, what? Bare naked ladies played your wedding? <laughs> like on the Thursday night? That seems weird. But uh, there's not a... I mean, when I started my agency in 2006, people say, oh, where the money is. And there's money in corporate. 
<laughs> there is. Sure. Well, so you're not, not spending your own money, which is the, the key. And also I made a conscious awareness. You're asking me what I did. I decided I'm going to wear a suit and tie and everything. I'm going to be squeaky clean and that I customize my content. So again, this is very different. Most people, when they do any form of entertainment and at my core, you call me a performer. I am a performer and that's what I do, but I'm a salesperson. You don't realize it, but I think all of us are salespeople. You just got to know what you're selling. And I told you, I'm selling memorable moments and I'm selling kind of a, a product that almost no one's seen before, which is the ability to seemingly read minds. So you're creating wow moments, memorable moments. And I do it based on what's important to you. So if I get hired by, let's say, a bank or a pharmaceutical company, I know their business model inside and out. I know their acronyms. I know what they do for a living. If I'm doing a product launch, I will know that product as well as their salespeople. And when I get done with the show, you feel you got a real value in terms of information. Because think, how often do you watch a presentation and still remember anything from it a week later? You don't, it's gone. I got my phone, I got my kids, I got this, I got a million stuff. So if you can make the medicine go down sweeter by entertaining somebody and then disguising it as entertainment, but within, boom, three or four key bullet points get weaved into the show, people remember that stuff. A year later, they're like, do you remember when he had Todd up there and we were doing the launch and did it? Like, it's retained. And so a lot of these companies get a real dollars and cents value out of what I do that's not purely entertainment. And that's what I locked onto. And that's what created my whole business model. If you don't mind me asking, like, you know, I I know that some of the rates for like keynotes and stuff, and, and sometimes, you know, they can be lower five figures, higher five figures, six figures. Some people have riders for private planes that they want them to fly into and stuff like that. You, you can make decent money doing this? I mean, I don't know how you define decent money, but I would say that, yes, I'd say that <laughs> you can make very decent money. <laughs> well, the reason I ask, and I'm dancing around it a bit because I don't need to know, like, what's your rate? Right. But, but I know that there's a tension amongst creatives. And maybe you don't consider yourself a creative, but there's this tension to want to do the things you want. And often people think of corporate as the thing they have to do to sell, to pay the bills. And so you were on America's Got Talent. You had Emmy-winning television show. You had to work with ESPN and all of these daytime shows and stuff. And so from an outsider perspective, I would go, oh man, that's so cool. Well, it's too bad you have to do corporate. But that's probably not your relationship with corporate, right? No, I don't see it that way at all. So I mean, the opposite way to think of it is if you had a show that either you traveled with, so if you were traveling theaters, kind of the way you would think of a band or most musical acts, uh, if you attain a certain level of success, let's say you're a musician and you've had, generally speaking, there's kind of a rule of thumb as how they book. If you had several hits, you're probably going and doing events for five figures. If you've had, you know, two good albums, you're probably at the low six figures. And then if you're somebody who's an icon, you might be hugging like seven figures. Like you get a Beyonce, a Bruno Mars, a name, those people, but it, there's different tiers of what they do, but one feeds the other. So cultural relevance, being on TV for most people is not a money maker, it's a money loser. But if you go do a TV show, generally speaking, what that does is it's a huge commercial. So if you're on a big TV show or you have your own TV special, you might not make any money. You might devote a lot of time to it. But now you've got, what is it, a 42-minute or a 21-minute commercial on network TV or nowadays Hulu, Netflix, any of the streamers. People now know who you are and you get an injection of, oh, you ride up a wave and now you have to coast on that wave. Now, most people either know how to coast and maintain or keep using it for momentum or you get one big hit and then you slowly decline. It all how do you maintain momentum at a certain, like a solid rate? Because if you get too much at once, you've seen people that blew up, you've heard about them for a year nonstop, and then you're like, what happened to them? They might still be doing great, but you need the cultural relevance. So uh, the way I describe it is you got to keep working on stuff, doing content, kind of like this, doing podcasts, doing TV shows, getting new fan bases that like what you do and people learning who you are. I love <laughs> corporate events. I'm a corporate person. When they see me, they know that they have a fixed commodity because if you're booking a corporate, the last thing you want is to hire a comedian who said he was clean and then drops three F-bombs. And then you're in trouble with your boss. People know that when they get me, what I'm going to do for them. And that's kind of, you want a consistent product that you know is going to kill. And that's what I've made my career on and being easy to work with. So many good things. If we go back to uh, the America's Got Talent stuff, I want to talk a bit about like leading questions. Yep. Because you talked about when things go wrong, your, your adrenaline kicks in. Your, but it seems like you have to be super focused every second of your performance. 
And yes. I noticed a few things. So for example, you were doing this thing with uh, one of the Spice Girls yeah. and you were asking her... Um, uh, I think it was Scary Spice, right? Yeah. You were asking her... Think of a vacation, think of a time, think of a trip, think of someone you've gone with. I don't know this. You've never talked to me before, all of this stuff. But you asked this question at a certain point where you go, it wasn't in the 90s, was it? And you asked it both to be able to say, oh, okay, cool. I, yeah, I, I didn't think it was in the 90s. Or when she goes, no, it wasn't in the 90s. You can go, okay, great, great, great. The 90s, great. Sure. And so there seems to be, because I love analyzing this type of stuff. I don't know if you're comfortable sharing it, but yeah. it seems to me that there's this craft to being able to come across as like super casual, but you know that you are asking questions that allow you to go left or right no matter what. Oh, um, absolutely. So that's how you feel people out, right? You can feel out what people are going to say. I had a buddy in college who was so great at joking around where he was so good at flirting with girls. I learned this early on where he would escalate it and say stuff in a jokey manner, just completely jokey. It was inappropriate. He'd say inappropriate things, but he would do it in a jokey manner where he could always extricate and take a step back and be like, I was just kidding. And it's, I, first off, I'm not saying to do that nowadays. This is 20 years ago. He's a bit me too ask, but he would just say things that I found inappropriate, but he had such a good disposition and jokey manner that it, I feel like if anybody else said it, he'd, they get slapped. But he was very good. So I learned a lesson there, which is you take a step forward, you take a step back. So when I'm feeling people out, it's obviously not for flirtation, but there's an element, which is the same thing. Flirting is the same as maintaining attention, which is the same as sales is like, how do you build that rapport? How do you get somebody comfortable with you? Because if they're tight and on guard, it's very hard for me to work with them. It's very hard for me to do something because they're not going to acquiesce. In the end, I'm the director of my show. So when you see me going in a direction. What if she said, I don't want to do a vacation. I want to do this. Well, that's not really what I want to do right now. That's not going to work. I'm controlling where we go in my show. If somebody else tries to take control, that's not going to work. I'm going to have to find a way to shift gears and go back to what my performance is and what I'm doing, right? I don't, it's not their show. It's my show. So doing that as an art in and of itself is knowing how to influence people. And yeah, oh yeah, we feel out in my stage show where I don't have to work with someone specific like TV. In, in just viewing somebody's body language, I go from this person to that person. And after the show, they come up to me and they go, why didn't you do me? I'm like, because you weren't as good. Like, I, it's, <laughs> it's, it's full on. They go, are some people more difficult than others? I go, is that even a question? That's like asking if some people are taller than others. Of course. There's a million factors that go into looking at somebody and in that one moment deciding, will they be perfect for this? And that's the skill. That's what is different between me and all the other mentalists in the world and the ones that are the best is knowing who's going to be great in the moment. And that's a million things are being analyzed at the same time that come down to what they're doing with their fingers, their hands, when they smiled, how they looked, how quickly they're speaking. When are they pausing? I can't explain it. It's like some mysterious recipe where I go, you're perfect. Come with me. And it just, bam, that's the skill. The skill is knowing who to pick. Oh, it's so good. There's some lessons that we can learn here, not only for sales and business development and things, but you know, people often... Uh, and I don't want to pat myself on the back too much, but people often tell me that I'm quite good at interviewing people. And it's a passion of mine. I love it. But mostly, like you said, I, people don't know the plan I have in my head for where I think this interview is going to go. Right. Or the beats I'm looking to hit or the order that we're going to go through the information. And so because I, there are typically four, five, six different beats that I plan to hit in someone's background or career... If they take the conversation any way, I can instantly go with them that way. And if we never hit those beats, I'm pretty cool with that still. <laughs> right? Like you and I can either just create something in this moment together that has never happened before, or, and I can give over control to you and come along for the ride, or I can do a regroup where I can just say, you know, like that is super cool. Okay. Now I wanted to ask you about this and I can just like change direction Ooh, on segue. you anytime I want. So for me, I've learned to be really comfortable trusting that in the moment, my uh, curiosity. Um, I get distracted really easy. Sometimes I th think of a question and then three minutes later, I'm like, I have, don't remember the question at all. Write it down, write it down. Like, what was I going? I like, well, not even. It's question. just like, because three minutes later, it's not a relevant question anymore. Right. So typically, it's like, I just trust that in the moment, I'm going to figure it out. Is that how you deal with this? Or are you quite no, in your head? I don't have as scripts. You're going? 
So I don't script my show the way you think a lot of stage performers do, and they have a set script, and they're going to go boom, 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 and you can see the people that have a script. You can you see it. jokes that, that work that don't fall flat. You must practice those jokes or those little moments, or is it all improv? So some of them, they've happened where the audience gives you gold. So the audience says something, and you go, oh my God, that was so funny. How do I create that situation or environment for that to maybe happen again or new situations. There are certain jokes that work in my show where you have one-liners, kind of like the way people that do crowd work. If you've ever seen really funny comedians that are great with the crowd, you'll see that they have certain stock lines. I don't want to call them stock lines because it denigrates it a little bit, but they have things they can do in various situations. Like they're going to encounter somebody who's too drunk at a comedy club. They have four different jokes they can make in that regard. You're going to encounter somebody who, you know, takes a phone call. If I get a phone call in the middle of the show, I have three or four different things I can do. There's amazing moments where I say, get them on speaker. And they go, hey, we're doing the mentalism. So they're like, what? And I go, let's read their mind. And it's an amazing, impromptu, authentic moment where I'm like, what are you doing? They're like, is this for real? And what you want is genuine reactions. People can smell BS from a mile away. A lot of the TV stuff, I did stuff for ESPN. People, I love it when they write this. They go fake, staged. I go, hey, hacked into DK Metcalf's phone. He has a $200 million contract. You go, how much do you think I could have paid this guy that he was going to play along to me? You know what I'm saying? It's so funny. So you can tell genuine, authentic reactions in the moment. And some of that is you prepare for it, but some of it is you embrace the unknown. And I love doing that. Every show is going to be different because I let the audience feed me the best lines. And I let the audience take me in a direction. The same way you're with the interview, if you just sat there with 10 questions, ask them in every set order, no matter what people said, you're going to have weird moments of like, well, why'd you ask that? He already answered it or he already <laughs> going in a different direction. You've got to adapt all the time. Yeah. So for America's Got Talent, every yep. time you showed up, not only with a different aha moment, a different reveal, you use different techniques even. Sometimes it's stuff on pads. Sometimes you're writing something, you're cutting something out. Like, How do you plan for an act then? And how do you practice when you have to kind of build the plane in the air? Like, You yeah. can't practice in front of a fake audience, right? So <laughs> this is bad. I want everyone to understand this is bad, but it keeps working for me. And so I'm being positively reinforced for doing something bad, which is I will say yes to things and have no idea how I'm going to do it. I will literally get a call. Let's say, I don't want to say the TV show, but I have a call for next week for a TV show. I said, yes. Do I know what I'm going to do? No, but I get forced <laughs> into a corner and that's when I get gold. So I always say the best creativity needs a deadline. If you tell me I'm going to be on TV in six months, yes, I'll come up with ideas. But if you tell me I'm going to be on TV in six days, I'm going to come up with better ideas because some people sink, some people swim. I swim faster and better when I have a deadline and I'm going to force myself into those moments of just kind of ideating, creating. I come up with a lot of stuff in the shower, which is a weird one, but it's really good for me. I come up with a lot of stuff while running. I run a lot and that's my Zen mode mm. because I'm not, I listen to podcasts, but I don't listen to music. And a lot of time I do nothing. I just zone out and I go, Oh my God, Oh my God, this would be great. And I just get these moments of what would be a cool idea. And I try never to repeat. So when I'm doing TV spots, if they're at a certain level, like a national or international level, I will not do something I've already done before, which most people think is crazy. They're like, well, why don't you do the stuff you're really good at? I was on right before the Super Bowl on ESPN, right before the highest rate TV show of the year, right before it, millions and millions of people watch. I created that whole trick in the two weeks before. Everything about it was done for the first time on air. But to me, that's the only way to live. Like I'm going to be more excited. The material is going to be stronger. It's good to practice it, but most of the practicing happens in my head. And yeah, to answer your question, I feel like you really need to force yourself. If you're thinking long-term, you need to create a deadline. Either it's fake mm -hmm. or it needs to be enforced. The same way, if you're going to run a race, tell everyone you just signed up for a 5K or 10K. Make it painful if you don't train and bail so that everyone in your life asks you, what about that 5K you were supposed to run? And you're like, oh yeah, I didn't do it. I want you <laughs> to be embarrassed. I want you to take heat. I want accountability, which if you're doing a profession like an entrepreneur, there is no accountability. If you sit on the couch no one's going to know you didn't make those 20 calls today or do your marketing or do all your stuff you were supposed to do. You need to have that self-accountability or somebody else around you so you can't make these excuses. Hmm. 
I had a friend who said, you know, most people get into being self-employed, creatives, entrepreneurs, they pursue their own path because they hate the boss, but then they desperately need the boss. Desperately need right? the they, boss. They desperately need the boss because we are the type of people who need the boss. I can't believe... That, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you don't just show up and shoot. You know, you show up and wing it. But it but I, <laughs> it does sound a bit bananas in a way, to me. But I plan it yeah. well, but there is some definitely winging it. Every show is like, you don't know what's going to happen. It's very... It's on the fly. So much is on the fly. Now you should see my uh, cell phone is filled with Otter notes. I use Otter AI for my voice notes. And I cannot go for a run or a walk without being like, Oh, you know, here's a voice note. And so there's like all these... My phone is filled with ideas and notes of me huffing and puffing away. So good. As, as I'm just like, Okay, this is why... And it's always like rants that I have in my head. And then I come back into my studio and I go to shoot it. And my team's like, Mark, that's not very good. It's like, it's like fake. It's not authentic. It's not real. And then I send them the original audio and transcriptions. And they're like, this is so good. Yeah. I can't bring myself to like record while, like, while running a 10K or something. That's the best stuff. That's so funny because I have that all the time. And this year I'm writing a book. And I've talked to people that have written books and just kind of gotten their sense. A lot of friends of mine... New York Times bestsellers, getting the, an idea of their process. Like I said, look at people that have done what you want to do and learn from them so you don't make those mistakes. And I get my best moments when I'm on the move, literally on the move. And I've decided most of my transcription and stuff is while I'm running audio. That's when I'm getting, when I sit in front of a computer, there's some sort of writer's block that gets in me where I go, oh, you know, that word doesn't sound good. I get hung up on stupid stuff instead of letting it flow. You need that flow and to let it out of you. And I find yeah. these podcasts are the same. Kind of this energy between us allows you to come up with ideas and craft ideas that are in me somewhere. But I'm hoping it's knowledge that's helpful to others, whether you want to be a mentalist, which you probably won't, but you probably have some sort of thing in your life that you're trying to do. And all of us are just trying to achieve some sort of goals, whether it's personal, professional, athletics, your body, your confidence, whatever. And at the end of the day, we're all doing the same thing, which is hopefully striving to be our best self. And to do that, you need to push. You need to push yourself outside your comfort zones. And I try to find ways to do that consistently. So at this point in your career, what's scary for you? You know what? Writing a book is quite scary because I've never done it. And I don't know whether it's going to be good, whether it's going to be a flop, where do I want to go with it? But I think that it's a combination of telling entertaining stories because I've been very lucky to meet a lot of very, you know, interesting people, successful people, famous people, you name it. Like being around those people is exciting in and of itself. So I kind of think that's going to hit strong. And then giving people bursts of knowledge on how to be, you know, uh, read their own mind, right? If my whole job is to unlock people's minds, to get inside your head. But what if you could use my skills to get inside your own head? Because at the end mm. of the day, I think your own mind is what limits most of us. You've seen people that can achieve. What is it that we can do? Figure out those roadblocks and get past them. I would love to have my own TV show. I've had one. Did well. Thank you for the plug. We won an Emmy, but we didn't continue. It was like a special and we didn't parlay it into a series. So that's my next iteration is whether it's a series that somebody else makes or nowadays, there's no gatekeepers. You can make your own show. You can self-fund. You can make your own show. It could blow up on YouTube. And frankly, go on a streaming network and more people will even see it than if you get a traditional network show. Like the world yeah. is evolving. When I was on Ellen last year and I told everybody, half my friends go, how do I watch Ellen? I'm like, I don't even know. It's gotten to the point where being on YouTube and being able to get millions and millions of views has a far wider reach globally than anything else you could do. People have decided to askew the normal gatekeepers and just put stuff out themselves, create their own brand, create their own niche and audience and kind of a fervent group of supporters that likes what you do. Yeah. You know, it's funny though, because you will get a ton of credibility from the more terrestrial uh, media. It gives you credibility because there's this feeling that it's been gated. And yet, I don't think people quite realize that with cable networks and with satellites in the 90s and 2000s, I went to film school and I worked in media. We were always very focused on it. But there was this huge push for more and more and more content. And then now that we've moved to streaming networks, I think most people are aware that there's a lot of garbage on streaming networks because right. they're just trying to buy as much content as possible. And so YouTube is such a great platform because, I mean, if you don't have to compete necessarily against all the other content that's on a streaming network. You don't quite get the credibility that you would on like a television station or something. But again, I haven't had cable since 2011. So I wouldn't even know how to watch half the stuff that exists. And a lot of Americans don't even realize that all of us in different countries 
can't watch your stuff. We get caught like Saturday Night Live happens to do something amazing and it's posted everywhere. I get this little notification saying not available in your country. On YouTube, we can though. And so the, the biggest problem with YouTube though is there's just so much there, but there's always room at the top for the best, for something different, for something amazing, for something with a wow moment. And uh, it seems to me that you've been able to build a really great business in such a weird niche. Right. And so if you move to YouTube or you moved wherever you choose to go with your career, and I'm really interested with where this book is going. You're really good, man. So, Thank you. Wow. I feel like there's room at the top for the best. <laughs> Listen, that's, that would be the ultimate goal. Kind of see what, you know, shoot big. So yeah, I, the real niche is in the States. And I've been more of a national performer by choice, to be honest. I have three young kids and I do international bookings. I'm going to lump in Canada, our neighbor to the north. My wife yeah, is yeah, Canadian. We, we're so within the Canadian. movie. Within the domestic box office, I call, uh, yeah. Canada's already part of America's box I office. I can say international Canada, when I say Mexico, when I say the Caribbean are all, I don't mind performing there. But when I have to fly overseas, which I will do on a handful of occasions throughout the year, it's just too much travel. Like I'm already gone so much as is that I prefer to stay here because there's so many big markets and so much to do that I'm not trying to take over other countries and be bigger. But here, mentalism is not well known. So the same way that if you were to say to somebody, who's the most famous magician, depending on what generation they are, you're going to get David Dave Copperfield. Copperfield. David Copperfield, if you're above a certain age, David Blaine and Chris Angel in, in two different age sectors. And depending on whether you're in the Midwest, whether you're like in different parts of the country, red versus blue states, you're going to get different awareness. Can we, can we talk about David Copperfield for a minute? The, the, like this Most dude, driven individual I've ever seen in my life. I don't know much about him, but in the 80s, I mean... I, I've heard I mean, he must have a huge confidence and I think he had a really big ego. I actually met him when I was five. Okay. He did this whole series or this whole tour where he you can like go to your local uh, theater and he would like do the whole stage performance. It was the one with the huge blade that would like come down yeah. and he made like ties dance and stuff. So my mom takes me there when I'm five and I had just seen Steven Spielberg's movie. Uh, gosh, what is it? Something Under the Sun. It's the one about like the British Christian family... Neil. Yes, Christian Bale is a little kid, a kid in it. Amazing. Empire of the Sun. Yeah. And he loses his parents in a crowd and is forced to stay and eat like canned food. And he's forced to stay. And I just seen this movie. I don't know what my mom was thinking because I'm five. But so I remember being in the lobby of the O'Keefe Center in Toronto, having just finished the show because he was going to sign autographs. And we get in this line and I am freaking out as a little boy. I'm crying. I'm so sure that I'm going to lose my mom and have to live. <laughs> In, you know, in squalor, like Christian Bale had to. And so we get to the front of the line and I had just spent 40 minutes crying. And he looks down at me and he goes, what's your problem? And he rubs me on the head because I had a brush cut at the time. This is the 80s. And uh, he was just like the coolest guy. And he was super nice. And the more that I've learned about him, the more I'm just like... Uh, what a rock star, man. Like yeah. he had like supermodel wives and he did all these TV shows and stuff. I mean, I don't know what happened to him. I got to look at him, but... Oh, he sold more tickets than any performer ever that's ever lived. Really? Yep, more tickets than anyone that's ever lived. That includes the Beatles, Elvis Presley, you name it. So he's got a breakneck schedule in Vegas. I mean, he does... You got to look up, but I mean, I think he still does over is he, is he still Is he still performing? Oh, yeah. He's still the top paid magician. He's been every single year forever. I mean, I'm not going to quote his rates, but I think he makes 60 or $70 million every single year. He's been in the top 10 of any entertainer. That means movie star, anything. I think top five forever for 20 years. He's just, he works harder than anyone. I think he does four or 500 shows a year, which when you map it out, it's more than one a day. He does two shows every day, like four days a week, three on Friday and Saturday. I, I don't want to mess up his schedule, but he yeah. is fresh for him do you think like after all of these years it's almost like when you do you ever see the movie troy where they talk about achilles and hector and they said achilles was told i think his mom said do you want to live a long life and be forgotten or do you want to be the greatest warrior that's ever lived and die young and they'll speak your names for thousands of years and he chose the latter and i not that same but i believe that copperfield is in his core you, you have to be he has decided that he will be a name when you and i are long gone in dust and 500 years from now, we won't know who I am. He will still be someone they talk about, like Houdini. He will live on for centuries because 
most people aren't willing to commit their life so strong. Like he's a workhorse. He's done something nobody else has ever done. So whether that leads to pure happiness, I can't speak to that. I don't have that level of ambition because I want to be with my kids. I want to be with my wife. Like I want to marry the two of work and life balance, but some people are driven. It's like Olympians. It's like outliers. The people that have decided I'm going to commit my life to something Mm. and I'm going to be the best or the biggest at it. And I think he is a shining example of probably the most successful magician that will ever live. Wow. I got I got to see if he has a biography. I love biographies, especially when you start to dig into people who are really like Phil Collins, like yeah, in the massive. summertime, I was I grew up with Phil Collins music and I, I was thinking was my mom just into him like because it was easy rock or whatever and maybe I only thought he was a big deal cuz my mom happened to be in him and then I found out he was the highest, he was the number one performing artist for the entire 80s. I believe it. Between Genesis Genesis and his solo career. And so I went through his biography and uh, I read it and it's, it's, they're, they're, it's remarkable how driven he was and how much work he did and how much he just wanted to just be in a band. And so I got to see if Copperfield has a biography. I have to read that one. I went through a stage last year of um, rock star biographies and I barreled yeah. through like, I did Guns N' Roses, Motley Crue. I did Anthony Kiedis. I just did Scar Tissue. That was a really good. One. I just did all the bands that I love. I just went through all of their biographies and man, they're just fascinating. Like aside from the sex, drugs, and rock and roll at that angle, just a lot of them, their childhoods, where they went. You know, a lot of these people are just obsessives in much the same way that I got into cards and tricks. Some of these people just, that was their outlet in broken homes was, I'm going to play guitar. I'm going to play drums. And it's a repetitive motion that has no set. You can always get better. Do you understand? It's like something that you're never going to stop being a student. And the day you do is the day you kind of start you know, atrophying. So I Mm. constantly am learning new things, try to like learn from new young people. If you start thinking, oh, someone can't teach me just because they're younger earlier in their career. That's silly. I learned from people that are below me that have different, they're not at where I am in the career, but you got to keep it fresh. You got to learn what the next generation is doing. What's unique. What's different. What do they think about? I love it. Let's get into the performance. I got to end big for you. Okay. Okay. Let's get in the performance. You know what? Here's what you do. Okay. I, I'm going to give them a quick uh, rundown of what, what here. You know what? Let's visualize this now. I want to give some texture to this. Imagine, okay. hold your hand out in front of you. And for our YouTube viewers, they're going to see this, but for everyone else, I'm going to take you through it. And Mark, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to imagine you have a globe in your hand. Now you don't really, just for everyone listening on a podcast, he doesn't, but I want you to imagine, give it a spin. You spin the globe, Mark, go start spinning it. And then you don't know, you literally have no idea where this is going to end up. And you take your finger and you slowly drag it and you stop, go ahead and you open your eyes. And this is kind of one of those moments you called it an aha moment. When you look down, you go, Oh my God, I didn't know where I was going to stop. When I look at this place, number one place, on my bucket list, I would love to go. Okay, you've thought about this before and you go, this, you know, you've never been there, correct? You've never been to this place. I've never been there. Okay, and and, and just, there's kind of categories. So I want our listener or viewer to know that some people are hyper-focused and they'll say, literally, I want to go to this attraction or this city, this country, or it could be a tropical island. But the way I framed it, globe, countries, this is a country that you're thinking of. Is that correct? Yes. Now, are you thinking of a few different cities in it or you kind of want to explore the whole country? Uh, the, I, I can think of some cities, no, but no, mostly no. the whole country. You. You just the whole country. Whole country. You just said the whole country is good. Do yeah. you have a pad of paper or something there that you can write this down so that the people that are watching on YouTube can know there's absolutely no way? This is not set up. Mark, before us talking today, did you have any idea that I was going to ask you this question or where we would go or any of this before today? Before today? No. No. Okay. So did you write down the country off camera where I cannot see it? Done. Now here's what's going to be fascinating because people are going to re-listen to this. I hope they do. And this is the part that's going to freak them out because it's, is this me reading you in a certain way or is this me putting thoughts in your head or thoughts of your own or dissecting. So here's the craziest part. You could have thought about this anytime, right? Everyone's listening. You could have put your finger on any place on that globe, but you mentioned the Christian Bale movie, which was Empire of the Sun. Do you remember that? And do. do you know where that took place? That took place in World War II and there was an internment camp and it was in Japan. And that's the place you just wrote down, isn't it? <laughs> How, hold on. It took place. I didn't even know that took place in Japan. I thought it took place in Korea. What's that? I thought it took place in Korea. I didn't even know it took place in Japan. It took place in Japan. 
Can How the tell, hell did you just do can that? Can you just tell the people that are not listening, uh, they're not watching YouTube, what did you write on that paper so they understand? I wrote Japan. You wrote I wrote Japan. Japan, folks. Let's keep going. Okay. Forget spinning okay. the globe. Okay. I, I, I want you to do something very secretive because people will say, maybe I got lucky or maybe you mentioned a movie so he knew and he gleaned that. Yeah, is, yeah, you got lucky. Is there <laughs> anyone that would know your ATM pin code? My ATM? No. <laughs> no, but... No, nobody knows my ATM nobody. pit code. So do nobody. this. I want you to, we're going to do this quick. I want you to give me a four digit number, but not anything from before. I want you to just make one up this right now on the spot. I yep. want this. Okay. So you don't say to me, oh, the globe and I could have spun. No, no. This is in this moment as spontaneous as it gets. Make up a random four digit number out of your brain right now. That's not really your ATM code. You're going to make it up right this second. So you can say Done. there was nothing beforehand, nothing yep. after. Give me yep. a random four digit number. Don't do one, two, three, four, go. Give me a random number. Yep. Say it. Oh, say it. Random. Uh, I, I can say it out loud. Make one up right now. <laughs> okay. Three, two, three, two. Three, two, three, two. Pattern repetition. So I just for everyone that's listening, I wrote down three, two, three, two, so I could analyze. So first off, I, I, I think that what you would have done is 100% you change the first digit because no one ever does. If your thing starts with a five, you didn't say five and then change the other ones because it's it's you don't want to do that. You might actually say the whole thing right. Your first, your actual pin code doesn't start with a three, does it? No. Of course not. I told you no. everyone does that. You're not an outlier. So I'm telling everybody, I just crossed off a three. Now, here's the important thing I need you to know. Hold on, hold on. Am I going to have to change my pin code? That's Is this about I'm to happen? I've got to ask you, are you okay? No, I'm yeah. not okay with that. <laughs> well, I, I've had it for a very long time. I'm not okay with the world the knowing that. might have stalled because I don't really know a way to show you without showing your audience. So I think you bringing me on. They want the the, the, the nitty gritty, the hard stuff. Can ah, I? Feel, okay, we'll I, change. Ah, oh, man, I'm gonna okay, I'm going to change it. I will change it. I think it. what you did, because three, two, three, two. Look at the repetition. The two and the two are the same. You know what? I know what you did, Mark. You didn't mean to. I bet you these two digits in your actual code are the same, aren't they? Is the second digit and the last digit the same in your real code? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You didn't realize you did that. You no, I didn't. How, you, you asked me how I do this. People <laughs> are predictable when they think they're being unpredictable. And there's right, because you planted you can, the seed and you said, okay, let's think of a pin code and now let's come up I with a random plant number. anything. I didn't plant anything. You named a random number. Three, <laughs> two, here's the funny thing. The two and the two are the same. Those are the same two numbers. I think what you did is you made some numbers smaller, some numbers bigger. I'm gonna write this down, okay? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write this down. Close your eyes. Okay, close your eyes. My eyes are closed. My viewers. eyes are closed. Eyes. I'm feeling close very them. uncomfortable right close now. Close them, don't open. Cover them with your hand. Everyone's okay. watching on YouTube. I'm going to show you this so you can see this. Everyone, I'm showing you this so you can see this. But for our podcast listeners, they're going to have to take my word for it. Open your eyes. Okay. Okay. Say, what is the first digit? I think the three was bigger, so you went lower. So it means it was a one or a two. Tell us, what's the first digit of your real PIN code? Are you really going to make me do this? Two. Uh, two. And then I already showed it to everybody who's watching on YouTube. Tell us the next three digits, or I can tell them for you. It's up to you. Do you want me to say them no, for you? Say, say them for me. This is too two, uncomfortable for four, me. 414 is your real pin code, isn't it? How the fuck did you do that? <laughs> now I have to change everything. <laughs> he just he just texted his wife. He's like, I don't know if you know this, but he knows our garage code. Lock the door. He's coming. He's coming to Toronto. No, you said my pin code. This is my bank card pin code. Folks, this is I just stage. Uh, this is I not just rehearsed. broke. I just broke the terms and conditions. Yeah, you <laughs> that might... I agreed to with with my bank. Yes, call BMO right now. Right now, uh, it's not BMO. I know that for a fact. You I'm actually BMO. cleaning out Mark Prager's accounts as we speak. <laughs> Mark, I'm going to leave you on a, on a high, high note, my friend. That's how I like to do it. I like to create a moment that I know you've had a lot of guests, but I'm hoping you'll never forget this one. I won't. I'm pissed at you. <laughs> <laughs> you told me we do hard things. Well, cracking into your pin code is definitely a hard one. Uh, okay, man. <laughs> so if people want to find out more about you, where should they go? Honestly, I don't think anyone goes to websites anymore. So the best thing yeah, to yeah, do... Yeah, don't say websites. Yeah, websites is at O's The Mentalist. Now, O's is a crazy weird name. It's an Israeli name. It's not a stage name. So it's O-Z, like ah. So at O-Z, The Mentalist... <laughs> Instagram, Twitter. Um, and then if you are somehow looking at websites, it's my name, which is OZ Perlman. So OzPerlman.com. And that's the best way. Honestly, Instagram, I post where I'm performing next, my next TV appearance. And you can just waste hours on YouTube or Instagram watching clips from TV appearances as you have done, my friend, and you will get added into the mix. <laughs>
I, I, I have to say, um, I am really, I'm really both uncomfortable and completely <laughs> pissed off right now. I can't believe you did that. <laughs> That's what I, like I mean. To I'm, do. I'm, I'm one. I'm, I'm gonna play along. But I've had, I've had that pin since I was like twelve. <laughs> So I'm turning 40 in two weeks. You have just ruined something that has been secretly mine for 18 years. So. You know what? I'm, I'm doing you a solid because this podcast is all about helping entrepreneurs and people grow. And yeah. Mark, it was time to grow beyond the 2414. It was time to grow. And we're switching it to a new one. And if we do this interview again, I'm going to reveal your new code when we do the new one. So you're screwed every single time. Know that it's never safe. <laughs> 